Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Innovation Nation. My name is Sarah, and this is episode 20. So I wanted to come on here and just thank everybody that has participated or been a part of the show. I also want to thank um, Lee and Mandy and Bert. You guys have been amazing to work with, and I'm so thankful that I have people like you supporting me behind the scenes. Um, what I thought was going to just be a quick little mini series in the beginning, you know, when I first met Lee and he invited me to participate in the inside and, and put some content together has truly blossomed into an amazing, amazing platform. So I'm just so, so happy and thankful, you know, that, that we have this and that, you know, innovation nation is really, a uh, become kind of like my second, my second, uh, my second job in a sense. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think what I realize is that I love learning and this has allowed me to do that by being able to bring on all different types of people who work in all different areas of our industry, whether it's building technology as a whole, physical security. And, um, you know, if anyone who knows me or works, you know, anyone who knows me or works with me knows that, you know, I love challenging whatever I hear, it, whether I agree or not. I'm definitely an outspoken individual. And I think what I love the most about this show is that I get to kind of sit back and be in the passenger seat to an extent and allow, you know, the thought leaders come on here and have a podium to speak, speak on and, and, and bring up, you know, topics in which they are passionate about. You know, I, I, I do my best to kind of sit back and let them be front and center. And so it's really, it's really been fun for me too, because it's, it's allowed me to challenge myself to kind of, to kind of sit back and relax. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, there's a lot to be thankful for. And I just want to make that really clear that I'm super grateful for everything everybody has done whether you participated, you help behind the scenes, or you just are listening in. So with that said, um, given that this is the 20th episode, I wanted, you know, I was kind of going back and forth on if I wanted to do this solo or not. You know, there's a lot more content coming that I, I that I could have, you know, put for episode 20, but I felt like this is a really special episode just because, you know, I never expected it to come this far. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to share a little, not a little, actually, I'm going to tell you about what I do. And <laughs> I know I've made, I've, I've made shameless plugs throughout my episodes. I know Alcatraz comes up. Um, it's, you know, something that I'm so passionate about that I love so much. Um, I would have, you know, I never would have expected to be working at Alcatraz. I, I never even like, it's just crazy. I think how things happen sometimes when you least expect them. Right. And, you know, I've, I've made reference. I think most people who listen in are familiar with what we do, but for those of you who aren't, I'm going to take this opportunity now to finally just lay it all out and let everybody know exactly what's going down. Because I think it's obvious that there's a buzz. And, you know, I think it's obvious that there's a lot of change happening right now within, you know, the physical security space as a whole. And, um, you know, this way, when I now bring it up in the future, and if anybody's listening into a future episode, and I mention it, you'll, you'll actually understand what's what's happening or what we're doing. So quick rewind to March. Um, the pandemic had just really taken off. It was like just really starting to become a big thing in the US. And, you know, at the time I was working at Johnson Controls, we were exploring different kind of technology out there or different technologies to help, you know, our end users with getting people back to work. Well, not back to work at the time necessarily, but how, you know, we were exploring technologies to help protect and keep those who had to work safe and secure. So like the essential um, workers who um, maybe were in healthcare or had 
facilities in which they, you know, couldn't shut down. Um, and so there was a COVID task force that was created within Johnson Controls. And I was kind of partaking in it. I was kind of participating um, voluntarily. You know, there were, there were specific individuals who are assigned to specific roles within. But at the time, you know, one of my customers was looking to invest in a new type of access control that would allow them to have a frictionless um, experience because at the time they were considering a conversion of their facility to be um, extra space for the hospitals. Um, it was a large, large um, entertainment center or an entertainment venue. <clears throat> and so, you know, first off, I had a mechanical and electrical background at the, you know, and that's, that's what I was trained from Johnson Controls. I learned all about building automation and I learned about mechanical systems. And I also was learning about, you know, I was able to learn about physical security, um, access control video, et cetera. And so at the time I was specifically exploring access control solutions, as I said, and I think Alcatraz was like the sixth one or the fifth one that I was like exploring and trying to figure out, okay, is this going to work or not for the customer? Now I had been burned in the past by other new technologies, no need to name names, but let's just say it made me a little more of a skeptic than I'd like to be when it came to putting a solution in front of a customer. And when I realized what Alcatraz was doing right off the bat, I mean, I was very intrigued. I, I was kind of, to be honest, confused. Um, and I think that's what made me even more intrigued is the fact that I couldn't figure out exactly what they were doing right away. And not in a bad way, but what I mean by this or by this confusion is that, you know, when I, when I first met Vince, our founder, he, he was explaining to me like all these things that you could do with a single device. And I was like, it was hard for me to understand that because as an integrator and being trained to put parts and pieces together all the time to solve many different problems, I wasn't used to a solution that could do so much with like just one device or like one platform. And, you know, part of what we do as physical security integrators is we take parts and pieces, we integrate them. That's why we're called integrators. So that in and of itself, I think kind of threw me off in a sense, but, but it, but like I said, it wasn't bad. It, it was kind of amazing to be honest. Um, Vince came from Apple. He also worked at NVIDIA. He was, you know, he's early thirties. I, and, and Vince, if you're watching or listening to this episode, you know, I'm hi, like, I'm not trying to like, you know, embarrass you or anything, but but the, but the point is, is that Vince blew my mind, like listening to this individual speak to me about all these things that you can do with a single device, having zero industry experience, not coming from our space, but having been able to bring so many solutions, solving so many problems that for years we were trying to solve is I think what really, really put me back. And so not only was I thrown off in a good way by how amazing this technology was. I was so impressed by Vince and like what he's done in such a short amount of time. I mean, the company at the time was still only around for four years or so. They've been doing R&D for four years. The exposure they had within the industry and having no marketing paid for, yet still making such a great buzz in the industry was also something that I thought was super positive. Um, I don't know. I just, to be honest, as you can see, even when I explain it to people, like I, I'm not at a loss for words anymore because now I kind of get it. But at the time I was just really, really taken aback. And I've always been like super obsessed with Elon Musk and Steve Jobs. And um, anyone who knows me knows that I'm kind of a nerd, not in a bad way. Just, I love challenging things. I love learning. And so when I met Vince, I, I, I was just so intrigued by him as an individual and what he was doing. And I, and I truly, like when I learned all about the rock and the product, I, I truly felt like someone was bringing like an iPhone or a smart device of physical security to me that like we had never seen before. So fast forward to now, I mean, I'm the director of channel sales 
I, you know, have been for the last six to six to seven months, uh, been building the channel and helping us bring in new partners to go to the customer and, you know, resell and, and provide, you know, I've been, I, uh, I, and I'll be honest, I, I, I'd never, I was the channel before, like I wasn't ever on the manufacturing side. So, you know, I have a background in operations and, and industrial technology. So I, I was somewhat familiar with like product and like what, what that was, but to be quite honest, really had no idea what I was getting myself into, except for the fact that I just thought that the technology was really, really cool. And, you know, felt like this was a company that I was gonna be able to make an impact, you know? So in 36 hours at the time, Vince had, and I had met, I learned about the tech, vetted it out, not to go work for them, but for the customers that I was planning to bring it to, and then ended up accepting an offer. <laughs> so in a really quick amount of time, back in the beginning, joined Alcatraz, took a risk, took a jump, a leap of faith, um, and here I am. So now that you kind of understand like, like just how I felt when I met Alcatraz, I'm going to explain to you like what we do and like what the rock is. And I realized like it would have made sense or it probably does make sense to like have Vince on this with me right now. But I think that at the same time, it, this is now a great, opportunity for you to kind of understand what Alcatraz is. And then maybe, you know, in a part B, I can bring Vince on and I can, you know, quiz him and, and do what I do with all the other thought leaders. But um, I, I think that, you know, what's really important to note, as I explain, you know, the rock and autonomous access control, it's something that's new. So when you hear me say facial authentication, for example, or you hear me say auto enrollment, or you hear me explain, you know, tailgating detection, all of these things are things that really haven't existed before. And that's part of why when I learned about what they were doing, I was also confused because I was so trained to think a certain way. And I was so exposed to certain types of technologies and was so focused on what I knew and not what I, you know, not what else could exist. And so I'm going to do my best to really simplify and break down what access, what autonomous access control is. And, um, and I urge all of you, you know, after you hear me go through this, reach out, do your own research. You know, I'm always here to support if you have questions, but I urge you to kind of like take your, your take off, you know, the comfort hat for, for example, or like, I guess like just, just allow yourself to be creative for a second and open your imagination because the, the key things I'm now going to explain are things, like I said, haven't really existed within our physical security space before. So Take whatever preconceived notions you may have, put them to the side and bear with me, okay? Access control is something for many, many years that has not been innovated. The actual action of a door unlocking and a panel sending an electrical signal to door hardware to open a door has been the same basically since inception. Uh, when it comes to like electric or, you know, electronic access control. And where I have found most of the innovation when it comes to access control, it's been around more credentialing than it has been around the system itself or the user experience. And so Given that access control today is still somewhat, um, still, still needs to, you know, there's a lot that still needs to get done, I guess you could say when it comes to the system itself and how we can innovate around that. But access control is also a very layered architecture. There's a lot of pieces and parts and components that you have to put together to control 
access and um which you know i think is what now leads me into explaining how and why alcatraz is really changing a lot of that the idea of autonomous is the same idea like an autonomous access control system is very similar to what you'd think of like an autonomous car if we think about tesla for exa example Elon Musk has developed cars that drive themselves. Whether you like that or not, it's happening, right? Like I, I, it's, I'm not here to tell you it's a good thing or a bad thing, but the reality is it exists. And there's all different ways in which he's accomplishing that. There's sensors built into the car. There's programs and software and processors, computer processors that are in the car to run software and make decisions. It's, it's not like you're just, the car's taking and receiving a, is giving and receiving a command. It's, it's like this computer that you're sitting in that's doing the work for you basically, right? That's kind of what autonomous is. We are eliminating monotonous tasks and leveraging technology or leveraging AR, AI, artificial intelligence to, you know, automate a lot of the things that we might've had to repetitively do as the operator. So driving a car is by a human is now being automated by the car. <laughs> How that's actually happening is for another day, another time. If anyone wants to know, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to, <laughs> I'm happy to enlighten you on, on what that is or what AI is and how we use it and how those cars drive, drive themselves. But the point is, is that when you think of that example and then apply it to access control, I don't mean like doors automatically opening. That's not what autonomous access control means. What autonomous access control is, is it's eliminating a lot of the monotony and repetitive tasks that are associated with controlling access. So whether you're the integrator, the operator and administrator or the user, there's all these different areas in which we as you know integrators or we as maybe the buyers, whoever it is that's interacting with the system, there's areas that create pain for us when it comes to controlling access. So whether it's integrating like a biometric device to the actual access control system. So shout out to all you integrators out there and designers, consultants, and maybe even end users who know what I'm talking about. But when you have to get one device to talk to another through software, pain. When you are actually issuing a badge to somebody, so many people are familiar with badges that we use in the buildings to get in and out of places. Uh, there's a badge reader there, a card reader. You present it at the door. Just issuing those and enrolling people and then managing that pain. When you are tracking alarms, so as the administrator, when there are alarms of events occurring, whatever they may be, doors being held open, unauthorized entry, whatever it might be, right? In which we can detect today. Often there are a lot of false alarms that get generated and going through that and auditing and knowing what's real and what's not, that's another pain. When it comes to the experience at the door in which I believe is actually the most important component of access control which we'll get to later in a few, but the actual experience at a door, presenting a, a, a card to the door is fine. Using your phone with Bluetooth to a door is fine. Whether that's the most secure way to control access is a whole different story. And the reality is, is that if you're still using a credential, like a card and a badge reader in its traditional form, uh, the truth is, is that's not really secure anymore. There's many ways you can go on Amazon and buy a credential copier, basically, where you can literally capture the data and then generate a new card by, you know, using this tool to copy credentials, and then you can get into doors and no one would know. There's all these ways that you can replicate Bluetooth technology. Uh, of course, there's issues around if a phone gets stolen, not only does the person who needs to get into the door now can't get in because they're relying upon that piece of technology, but now someone else might have a phone that allows them access to somewhere they're not supposed to go into. I'm sure you're listening to this and saying, okay, but you need your face to open the phone. Well, 
unfortunately, I, you know, not unfortunately, but I, I'm here to say that that's not only it. There are technologies too, where you can walk up to a door, wave your hand over a reader, and it will connect to the phone in the bag. And it doesn't require any other layer of authentication. So anyone can have that phone, move their hand over the door and walk in. There's all these intricacies around that, right? In which I just explained. Now, when we add in biometrics, which means utilizing a component of a human to confirm we are who we say we are, that's a whole nother story as well, right? The experience often has been very, very clunky or frustrating to deal with. The reason why I've just broken down all of these different pain points within access control and traditional access control is because that's exactly what autonomous access control is eliminating. Autonomous access control did not exist before Alcatraz. If you were to Google it, it wouldn't, it didn't come up. And feel I'm happy if anyone wants to challenge me on that, I'm all for it. But I could tell you myself, when we were figuring out whatever it was we were doing was called at the time, which, you know, because originally when we first came into the market and when I also first learned about Alcatraz before I worked there, it was just considered like a biometric reader. That's what we were calling it. We were calling it a biometric reader. After enough realizations and epiphanies, we realized, okay, it wasn't just that. So we had to figure out what it was called, which is what led us to autonomous access control. We don't replace the need for the access control system, nor do we replace the need for readers necessarily. I mean, we can, and in a perfect world, people would be opening doors with their faces, no questions asked. We're not fully there yet as a society. We understand that as Alcatraz, but if it was a need and someone wanted to get that done today, they could. What the point is, is that we've basically brought together or put together this this piece of hardware that we would call a smart device that you can use in any environment and eliminate all those things I just described to make the experience for everybody involved better. Auto enrollment, tailgating detection, facial authentication, camera, the device is a camera too, and analytics are like the, the five, five things that are like our core principles of what we can do with a single device. Our product is called the rock, as I've mentioned, and this rock, this device opens the door literally and figuratively to all this different types of technology that you can leverage in that device. So what we call that is edge technology. Edge technology is something that is very common today. It has been around for a very long time, maybe not so much in the security space, although it has been around for many, many years in, 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 in other spaces. Your phone, your smartwatch, drones, um, you know, autonomous drones maybe, or you know, basically anything you can think of that you can basically either hold in your hand or is what we'd consider compact or where decisions are getting, hap are, are getting made right there within the device is considered edge technology where there's a processor, whether it's a big or a small, depending on the device itself, built into it and software that lays onto that processor. Basically you feed software to the processor so then it can do something, right? So like the way we use computers, you put software into a computer and then that allows you to use it, right? So, and I'm not trying to get too technical here, but the point is, is that edge technology has existed for many years and it's been around us for a very long time. The way you can take your phone and do all these different things in your hand is the same idea. So Vince brought this to us. This is what Alcatraz is doing. It's not necessarily like much of the technology is new, but a lot of the ways in which we are changing access control are new. And we're introducing principles now that didn't necessarily exist before. You can you can actually have real data in real time associated with alarms in the access control system without having to integrate, completely agnostic to whatever is already there in the environment with real time information and data that, for example, can help eliminate the time wasted with false alarms. You can utilize the rock to detect unauthorized entries and people who are tailgating, either piggybacking, or if someone's leaving a door and someone's going in that isn't supposed to, 
you can track that as well. And you're not having to create a Fort Knox at the door. And it's a way more cost-effective way now to not only be able to detect tailgating, but also have the information virtually. Um, the rock itself is also a camera. It has an OMVIF camera that's certified that is a 1080p high def resolution that can be pulled back into a video system. You also are using multi-sensor technology in the device for the facial authentication component. Everything is fully encrypted. I mean, I can go on and on. As you can see, it comes so naturally when I start describing what the rock is because I've done it so many times. But the point is, is that we're able to bring so many different pieces of technology together to solve many problems with one device. Like the rock itself is an extremely robust, smart device that can be used in so many different ways. So <clears throat> I know I've you know spent enough time at this point kind of sharing with you what Alcatraz is and what we're doing. Um, I didn't I don't want my episodes to be about Alcatraz. So I felt Alcatraz deserved one on its own. And given that this is my 20th episode, you know, Alcatraz is very important to me. I love everything about the company and what we're doing. And I feel like there's so much opportunity that we can learn from in the way that Vince and the team execute. I mean, I know a lot of people aren't familiar with us yet. I know our name has gotten out there and a lot of assumptions have been made by the industry on what we're doing. But at the end of the day, I just, I urge you all to really take a, take a, take a moment to, to actually, like I said earlier, put your creative hat back on and think about all the opportunity in which we can impact our environments and make them better. And at the end of the day, you know, to us, along with all the things I've mentioned, the user experience is what we care the most about. So when it comes to the actual individual at the door, that experience of walking in through your door and being authenticated right there is ultimately what matters the most to us. And that is where we are really trying our best to innovate. The same way you can open your phone, you should be able to open your door. And all of this ties back to the recent article I wrote about digital identity, because as an industry, I feel like we've kind of struggled with that concept and deciding what defined the identity, like how we were going to decide which credential was the best credential to use. Often we, you know, what I've noticed is we've added all these layers in to authenticate users that in my mind are quite unnecessary. And we are at a point now in society where post COVID as we heal, we have an opportunity to kind of catapult forward and do things right. And if, and if there was anything that I think mattered the most now, it's the user experience in regards to how we bring people back to work. Because the reality is, is that what you look like and who you are and how you show up and what your name is, isn't enough these days. Unfortunately, as we evolve, things like negative COVID tests, normal temperatures, vaccination reports are going to be a part of your identity and whether you know i agree with it or don't like do i like it personally i don't really know yet to be honest i haven't gone back into an actual office space to know what that feels like and i, I and i and for so long i actually don't really remember now what it what it feels like to be around so many people and i also haven't realized like what it might take for me to feel comfortable doing that because, you know, we're still having to socially distance, you know, the vaccine hasn't fully been dispersed. But what I can say is that, you know, if there was anything I think that mattered the most, it was just that we take advantage of the fact that there's an opportunity right in front of us to do things right. And as an industry, you know, we 
have the ability to make an impact on that user experience by providing and leveraging the right technologies to do so. And um, if you do read my article or if you are interested in, you know, kind of learning more about it, um, I, I first recommend obviously reading it, but I would also say, feel free, you know, I, I recommend you to reach out, you know, if you really want to talk about it, because digital identity is something I think that doesn't get addressed enough. And if you were to Google it, there's not enough information about it. I also think that we're still figuring out what it really is. And as it ties back to Alcatraz, you know, in our terms, in our mind, to us, the human is the human. The user is the user. The way the face opens your phone, like what Apple's done, the phone is the door, the user is the user. That's it. Simple, easy. We're not adding a layer in. We don't want to add a layer in. Personally, I don't think we should be adding layers in. We've done it for so many years and I, and I still to this day don't understand why. Um, I know traditionally we've always thought the more layers to a system, the more hardened it is. That's how you secure more by making it more complex and complicated. But we're in an age now where we can leverage other types of technologies to secure a facility or environment without having to add in inconvenient layers. So I hope that this was somewhat helpful. I know I kind of went all over the place here, but I really hope now you kind of understand like what Alcatraz is, how we're changing the industry, how we're introducing autonomous access control, not only to the end users who are at the door with that experience of opening doors with their face or the integrators or the operators. I hope you know that whoever you may be that would interact with us or a rock, um, I hope that this was helpful for you to now understand like why we're doing what we're doing. And ultimately, I really believe that this is going to be the future. I think that even though facial recognition has gained so much bad, bad exposure in a sense, or bad media, bad opinions around it, um, I actually think that we're going to get over that eventually. And I think, I think the reality is, is that it's all about what you're doing with the data and where, you know, what it's being used for. Now, facial rec just to surveil and look at people and match faces to names, I think is absolutely inappropriate, but, you know, to an extent, but what you'll learn if you do end up, you know, researching us and figuring out what we're doing, safety is the things, privacy and security are like the top two things, obviously that matter to us besides the user experience. And in order to make that user experience so great, privacy has to be at the forefront. The same way Apple has done that with their tools is the same way we realize the only way we're gonna make the experience the best is by being respectful to the users interacting with us. So once again, thank you for allowing me to come on here and kind of preach and finally share with everybody what I do and what Alcatraz is. Um, I think at this point, you know, <clears throat> it would only make sense for Vince to join me. So, so maybe in the next couple uh, shows, we'll, we'll get an appearance from him. Um, if he, if he happens to find enough time in his day to actually do it. Cause um, if there's anyone that I've met that, that has more meetings than me, it's probably him. I don't, I, I, if anyone who knows me knows that I'm always doing a million things at once. And Vince is definitely like that too, but in the best way. Um, so hopefully we can get him on at some point. And I really hope that this was helpful. I urge you all to go ahead and take a look at that article, skim it, you know, whatever it is, and please reach out if you have any questions or want to talk about it. Um, and once again, just thank you so much for, for supporting me and uh, being a part of this platform. Have a wonderful day.